This broadcast features uh, one of my best friends, uh, one of the longtime uh, True Fire educators, and um, definitely my favorite bass player on the planet. It's Stu Ham. Uh, uh, for those of you that have been on another planet, Stu, um, he's the only bass player to have ever won Guitar Players uh, Magazine's Reader's Poll best rock and best jazz bass player two years in a row. Uh, he's played with Joe Satriani, Steve Vai, virtually every significant guitarist also on the planet. Eight solo recordings, dozens and dozens of projects with other, you know, top line artists. Here, here at True Fire Alone, I mean, these, you know, 12, 15 courses, uh, for beginners, for advanced players, uh, solo bass, funk bass, blues bass, uh, fretboard fitness, one of our all-time top-ranked courses. Um, he's the man, <laughs> what can I say, and I love him. Hello, Stu. <laughs> oh, what happened there? That was one heck of an ending there. That was. But you're the consummate pro. Hey, man. And handled that beautifully. Well, just let me, uh, just let me do this. Oh, there's an ending. There you go, man. There you go. I feel much better that we've resolved. I know. So um, uh, you're here doing two new projects. Yes, I am. Which I think will bring what? That's that's 12, I think 14 projects with True Fire. Over all these years, you were one of not not I think certainly the first bass player, but one of the first few artists that actually, you know, believed and kind of bought into this crazy technology thing that we were doing. I think we when did we get together? You know, fifteen well, what, years. What Brad's ago? trying to say is we'd known each other forever. <laughs> I was talking with uh, Ran when he drove me in here this morning at like four a.m. California time. By the way, that um, thing I miss most about the old building was the old posters you had, of, like the big hair guys. And remember, it used to be <laughs> before right. the technological geniuses like yourself uh -huh. created these incredible uh -huh. virtual platforms for people like me to teach. Uh -huh. There used to be the, the dial 800 shredder <laughs> that's lessons, right. man. That's I, they right. had to picture a guy on the phone with the big hair. <laughs> that's right. It was awesome. That's we we did all those uh, audio lessons for Bass Player Magazine back See? in what was that the uh, man uh, the early '90s I think well way before the internet and yeah. uh, you participated in that as well. Um, you remember the uh, first studio you came to True Fire and filmed the little mezzanine. I sure no. that, that's where you had the pictures downstairs in the little hallway <laughs> you'd, in the bathroom you'd with the like guy in the phone. You'd lose 10 pounds just doing a session there. We had no <laughs> AC or we had to turn it off anyway. <laughs> the hot lights, the whole thing, right? Um, so you're here doing two new projects. Correct. Uh, they're both in, you know, blues essentials and jazz essentials. Yeah. Uh, 10 performances in each one. Let's talk about the blues one first, right? You know, what I, want, what I wanted to do is um, I always like to, to provide a historical and educational aspect to my courses. Of course, you know, the bottom line is there's 10 different blues songs that I'm showing you the fingerings to and how to play them. But I'm also trying to slip in there what you're doing, why you're playing them, right? Why you're playing the notes you're playing. And my hope is that if, if you're a beginner or moderate, you know, uh, and you get this Blues Essentials course, it's gonna show you different styles of blues, teach you a little bit about the language so that you can get on stage at your local jam session and the guys say, okay, shuffle in A minor, or, you know, slow minor blues in A, or shuffle in E minor, or let's start on the five chord 
sort of the language that they speak about you right. know, in blues things and different turnarounds used for runs, you're going to know this language so that you'll be able to sit in. And, and you know, one thing I teach, the great thing about bass is that since it's all tuned in fourths, that once you learn the fingerings for these real simple bass lines of outlining chords or playing the root and fifths, then you can just move your hand around and, and play in any key. So if you can play a blues in G, you can play a blues in E sharp. Yep. Right? Yeah. What I love um, and have always loved about your courses is you do, you know, and, and look, many of us do like to pick up on a course, go learn a lick, go learn a solo, a, a comping pattern or something, but may not really understand, you know, what's under the hood of right. that, you know. You always dig deep under the hood and you give students a really good understanding of why they're doing what it is that they're doing, why it sounds so good, and, you know, how, how to deal with that style, that groove, that kind of a bass line when they encounter it on stage. And, you know, that's why your students love your stuff. Well, that, that's the idea. Do. Again, it's just it's hands-on, physically showing you how to learn these licks, yeah. and then giving you the seed of why. And if you want to dig deeper, if you know, sh just showing you the path that if it appeals to you, yeah. showing you where you can go to understand it and advance your playing and your understanding of the genre. Pick one of those blues. Uh, let's do it. Which one? Let's do. Uh, let's do a shuffle, man. Shuffle works. What could what could be more essential than uh, if you want to be a blues bass player than to learn how to play a shuffle in G at ninety six beats per minute? <laughs> Pregnant pause. Pregnant pause for Tommy two times two, I believe. Uh, this is uh, in the. This is no, actually number three uh, in my course of ten examples. Okay. Uh, the first ones are just really basic. What, what key did you say this was? Key in? of G. Key of G. Key of G. Uh, oh, it sounds like this. This is it. Oh yeah, baby. So um, what I love about the course, you know, rooted to what we were just talking about is, you know, you'll teach that. Obviously, it'll be all, all be tabbed out and all that. And someone right. can take that shuffle. They can move that around to basically any key. But what I love is how you kind of dig deeper into what a shuffle is, you yeah. know, why you're doing the things that you're doing. And, uh, you know, those are the tools, you know, that you need to be able to play with a lot of people in a lot of different scenarios. You know? And in, in most of these blues courses, like on that one in particular, number three, the shuffle, this is um, the first few examples in the key of A, and I'm just sort of trying to teach people, absolute beginners, how you can play one, four, five, like what one, four, five means, right. which is the language of, of blues, right? right? If you don't understand that, I'm going to explain it to you, and you can play with open notes. Yep. And then here, number three, I'm saying we've learned these fingerings. Hey, let's move it down to G. Right. And and, and all of them, uh, the first time through, I'm playing a simple bass line, just. And the second time, I'm adding a little bit of a, a, a slide between the minor third and, and major third. 
So it, on every uh, course, on every uh, performance um, review or, or you know, uh, segment, there are basically two baselines, a simple one and then a little bit of an embellishment line. And then the breakdown to basically lift the hood on um, what it is you're doing. Yeah, you're doing. yeah. Showing the fingerings and showing alternate fingerings. Yeah. You know, um, I, I remember it, Stu was in the house rhythm section at All Star Guitar Night, oh, which man, we, which so we ran fun. for like, what, 10 or 12 years. Oh, I missed that so and much. And Stu and Danny Gottlieb, yep. uh, bass and drums, and they had to, um, you know, there was no rehearsal time, and we would have anywhere between, what, you know, 10 and 15 uh, different guitar players players in 10 or 15 different styles right and you would have to you know support them in their gig and uh, you know um but you know for me i'll never forget it was uh um who was that jazz player you did cherokee right oh yeah you, you went from a rock thing and then a country thing and then a funk thing and then uh, Johnny from Johnny Highland to Mike Orlando at right. the Santa Ana Theater. And was it Oberg, Andreas? Andreas Oberg, Oberg right? yeah, Who, yeah, killer player, right? Absolutely. And um, I remember being a little worried because there was no, and he called out Cherokee, turned around to you guys. I know where you're going with this. Up tempo, God knows how many beats per minute, and you know you just hung tough all the way. You know, well, you get, just, are you going to give the punchline there, Brad? What's the punchline? <laughs> well, the punchline is, is that uh, I think for, the, for people that, that sort of are familiar with me, mo know me mostly from my work with Steve Vai and Joe yeah. Satriani, yeah, yeah. and then my solo career is <laughs> Stu Ham, <laughs> right. who sort of right. developed and invented this you know, solo style playing and slapping and tapping. Yeah. Not that I invented it, but you know, when I was 16 years old, no one slapped on right. the bass. No right. one tapped. A couple of people played harmonics. Yeah. You know, I was there when it all changed. Right. And now you got kids by the time they're 16 that have to learn chords, tapping, slapping, bebop, soloing. Yeah, it's the vocabulary. That, 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 that didn't exist. Right. And I was good. So most people know me as, right. oh, the guy that plays country music. <laughs> right. They don't know that I can read my, oh, yeah, ass off. Right. That I play upright bass. You right. know, that I uh, come from, you know, old school where I'm happy to play. Right. Right. But people don't know that. They're right. like you. They think I'm the guy that just plays. Right. So you heard me one night and you said, he came up to me and said, Stu, you're a good bass player. <laughs> like with a feeling of shock. And it, I was like, oh. No, it was, you know, I admit it, right? Like um, it was that night with Oberg after you played Cherokee, yeah. after that gig. Because I, I think you had to support God knows how many styles. And I. I'll, I'll be honest with you, I was nervous because I knew Oberg was going to do Cherokee. You know, I had hoped that you guys got together backstage. And, I mean, you blew me away. So well, that yeah. was that night. Yeah, nobody um, knows. I mean, the, 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 you know, making a living as a musician, you really have to be diverse. And it's strange because you can get easily typecast. Yeah. You know, for about three years in San Francisco, I did this show called Teatro Zinzani. Yeah. That was sort of like a Cirque du Soleil dinner theater. Yeah. Great. The musical direct, director, yeah. Norman Durkee, one of the most amazing musicians I've met. And I came in for the audition, and I sight-read treble clef, and I played fretless, and I played upright, and I followed cues by jugglers. Yeah. And you know, he said it was one of the best auditions he'd ever seen. Yeah. But if someone had told him, hey, that's Stu Ham, yeah. I wouldn't have even gotten an audition for like yeah. a circus well, show gig. I, I know. Well, that's a double-edged sword. I mean, you were, you know... I, you know, those Satriani concerts, wasn't that where the whole stew, That's it, you know, baby. so people would think, what? Well, tell that story, okay? Well, you know, in America, but around the world, too, it's people like to, especially when they're in a group setting mm -hmm. and they get mob mentality, mm -hmm. if you add a little alcohol, it's fun to go, ooh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like yelling at the moon. So right. when people go to see Bruce Springsteen, they go, Bruce. Right. And who was the guy that are running back for the Dallas Cowboys? Um uh, the same thing, moose. Right, right. So right, they would right, say, Stu, and right. then Stu. But of course, inevitably, people thought they were booing me. <laughs> and to this day. And and I remember we were playing the Beacon Theater in New uh -huh. York, and, and Joe's mother was there. And, and she literally said, man, I, I thought that young man played very well. I don't understand why, why they're booing him. So it really bugged poor Joe. And he had this whole, uh, I think when I came back with him to tour in 2008, or uh -huh. maybe it was the Engines of Creation tour, he had this whole internet campaign where Let's all yell ham, ham, uh -huh. and it's just not the Didn't same work, as going, right. ooh. 
Oh, man. I, I still get asked that. I got asked yeah. that at the NAMM show yeah. five days ago. Uh -huh. Stu, oh, why? Eh, Stu, oh, why are they all booing you? <laughs> oh, why? Uh, tell me why. Oh, God. Uh, uh, it cracks me up every time I hear that story. Well, I feel bad um, for Joe because, you know, I haven't been in his band for about 10 years now, right. but every concert he plays, somebody it's going to go, Stu, in uh -huh. the back of his head. Poor guy. You know, um, but that's what happens, right? You sort of get typecast as the rock bassist, you know, and then somebody, including myself, sees you on stage doing incredible jazz work or, you know, whatever style. Um, and it's kind of surprising, you know, wow. that someone is a master of all those styles. I've, I've seen you, um, you know, and, you know, there, there are bass players out there today extremely gifted that just won't sit back and play root fifth, root fifth when the song, you know, calls for it. But I've well, seen well, you I mean, do well, that. You know, I mean, that's the funny thing is, is um, again, uh, boy, Fender built my daughter this little miniature 26-inch scale bass yeah. called a mischief bass. Yeah. And and for the short, brief time she picked up the bass, she picked it up and <laughs> starts doing like this. Uh -huh. And I said, no, Charlotte, Charlotte, no. The way you play bass is like this. And she said, but Dad, you go like this. <laughs> right. Busted. <laughs> so, um, you know, we have a live chat going on right now, and um, people are chiming in right now. Hello, Stu, Internet from people. Brazil, Poland, Helsinki, uh, Finland, North Carolina, Central Illinois. Central Illinois. Um, Holy cow. Miami Beach, Netherlands. Um, if you're out there, let us know where you're tuned in from and we'll shout out to you um also someone wants to know if you're tom hanks <laughs> i am not tom hanks apparently i look like look tom like hanks tom. i've yeah. gotten who's who's the guy uh john goodman i get that sometimes do you really and like, when my hair's really long i i can, I, I was, I can sort of see that i was that. doing a gig in saint kitts yeah with uh bobby kimball and uh -huh. and and uh who's the guy from sons of champlin anyway bill Bill Champlin. Anyway, and uh, some guy, some drunk lady, really thought I was Robert Plant just because of the hair. I was <laughs> I like, "Wow, well, Robert's been really gone downhill. <laughs> Poor guy." Um, Where's Allison Krauss when you need her? <laughs> Play another uh, uh, another one of the examples from the blues. Course, All right. So again, we'll again you know, I'm trying to give everyone a, a full range of the different blues, the different kinds of changes. So this is my um, introduction to a minor blues, uh, and we're an A minor. And uh, we're talking about how, you know, one, four, five, but in the minor blues, the turnaround is going to be like minor six to the four. This so, and before you do that, give, give us an example of, so you you know, you, you get upstate, you, you haven't rehearsed, someone calls out, what would they call out and how would you, you know, approach they, they, You know, for this, this, this basically, I, you know, it sounds a little like the song, Brother Can You Lend Me a Dime, mm -hmm. which is one of the classic blues songs. Mm -hmm. Ever, right? But they would say, uh, you know, hey man, you know, let's do a uh, minor blues slow. Uh, we'll do a six, you know, flat six turnaround. Okay. Which is sort of standard mm -hmm. for in a in a major blues. You know, you're playing five, four, one. Right. But if you're playing like the thrill is gone or something, right. or minor blues. It's a, it's a different turnaround. Right. So I want to show them musically what it is and, and what it means. There's another example where uh, I, it's called start from the five. You know, yeah. we'll tell you, let's start a blues in, in uh, F. I'll start on the five. Yeah. Right, which means you have a little tag intro starting on the fifth chord, which would be C in the key of F. Okay. So anyway, here's a minor blues in A at 60 beats per minute. Ah, two-bar intro, that's right.
Nancy. Minor blues, baby. So, uh, correction, um, you don't look like Tom Hanks. You sound like Tom Hanks. I sound like Tom Hanks. Well, he's done voice. So, you know, that is actually me in uh, Toy Story 3. But <laughs> there you don't go. tell anybody. And he's miming the, uh, right? <laughs> um, okay, more shout-outs from France, L.A., Alabama, Texas, Rhode Island, Colorado, Canada. Awesome. Um, so, um, this, is, this is interesting. There's a... Um, I'm a, a question. I'm a singer and I play guitar. I like to pick up the bass and I'm looking for guidance to do that to my best ability. It looks like you're the man. And w what I love about that question is you and I talk about this all the time about, um, and many of your courses are I ideally formatted and presented for, you know, we have tons of guitar players here, right? right? Um, you know, we talk about why we think it's important for a guitar player to learn how to play bass. Right. To give them a better understanding of music. Talk to that a little bit, would you? Sure. Well, I mean, I've worked a lot with guitar players. And again, it's funny for the people that just know me from all that, that solo stuff. You know, I mean, I, I learned, you know, by playing upright bass and walking through changes in a really great high school jazz band in Champaign, Illinois. Um, and um, so I'm not a play to play simply, and I always try to emphasize, you know, what that you want to play, what's appropriate for the music. Mm -hmm. I'm also old enough where the the taste gene, mm -hmm. you know, has, has kicked in. Uh, also, you know, I come from a family of educators. You know, my father was president of the American Music Associ American Musicologists Association. He was the first person to teach an academic course on the study of popular music. Uh, started the International Association for the Study of Property Music. Uh, my mother was an opera singer. Uh, one of my brothers teaches uh, Chinese literature at the University of Washington. My other brother uh, runs the Ali Opera Khan School of Indian Music and lives in Calcutta part of the year, plays Sarod. So when I grew up, oh boy, all forms of music from opera to jazz to avant-garde to pop were all treated uh, as seriously, and we were exposed to a wide variety of music, you know, and there was no snobbery of between classical music or or Judy Collins, you know, and it was great. It was it was a great upbringing, and so hopefully I've picked up some of the teaching gene, mm -hmm. and uh, I and being around my brothers and have you know taught at Berkeley and running the, the bass department at MI for a while, and mm -hmm. always having a lot of private students. You know, I've developed techniques as teaching, so I like to think that I'm patient and can approach people by showing them the basics because you can't. Speaking as the father of a 19-year-old daughter, you can't teach anybody anything, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I take lessons myself, right? And what you can do is point people in the right direction and show them what they need to work on. You know, if I, I go to, to a, many of the number of people I take lessons with, they'll give me, you know, I, I used to camp out in front of Jeff Berlin's house and stalk him in, in Boston to get him to give me lessons. And when he finally did, when we were on the road, I had a band called B Times 3 with myself, Billy Sheen and Jeff Berlin. And he finally gave me this one jazz exercise that I could literally be working on the rest of my life. <laughs> so that's, that's what a good teacher will do. You know, they can point you in the right direction, show you some tools, and then it's really down to how much, you know, time. Because, you know, sadly, there, there's no, uh, it, you know, it's, it just takes repetition, uh, patience, and the passage of time. Practice patience and the passage of time. Yeah. And you can get better. And why, why should a guitar player learn a little bass. What what perspective well, does for, that give a guitarist? From the that from would the be from the from the same way that I would want to learn guitar, mm -hmm. how they function, you know, in the music. Uh, the cynical answer would be so they can put me out of work. <laughs> but believe me, I I have I know and have worked with many uh, guitar players who think that they can just double the rhythm guitar line uh -huh. and play bass on their records, yeah. and it don't sound too good. Right. So whatever it is that makes a bass player a bass player, uh, it's fu it's so funny how either you choose the instrument or the instrument chooses you yeah. according to your personality and your genetic makeup or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I found the bass players are pretty mellow people that hold it all together. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done all these camps, you know, guitar camps, and you get two guitar players on stage, and it's it's you know it's pretty much a competition, right? Even if they're the coolest guys in the right. world. But, but unbelievably, I, I've been to many of these base camps, and not, not that there ever should be, 
you know, five bass players on stage playing Red Baron mm -hmm. that never should be, or Chameleon. But right. if they are, generally they'll talk to each other like, okay, listen, you play chords, mm -hmm. you know, you play, you know, rhythm, and then, yeah. then I'll play the bass line. They talk together. Yep. That's the way they are. Guitar players, it's just, I can play faster than you. Mm -hmm. Something in the genetic make makeup yeah, of, of I guess bass so. players. It is true, <laughs> I man. Guess. I, I'm not arguing. I'm either. telling you. <laughs> um, let's talk about the other project you just completed down here, the jazz yeah. essentials. What do you cover there? I, again, man, it's sort of like a history. It's I'm trying to subliminally also do sort of a history of jazz. Um, so it, it, it goes it, incrementally. It gets more difficult. You know, it starts out with a two beat. What does two beat mean? Why, why should I play a two beat? Mm -hmm. And it teaches the bass player, uh, again, you know, jazz voices, jazz chords, but, but uh, underscores the fundamental role of a bass player is to play the root of the chord when the chord changes to establish mm -hmm. the tonality. Mm -hmm. Because that, the, can I make a little demonstration here? Sure. That's why bass is the coolest and most important instrument in the band. It's because it, it unites the harmony and the melody, right? You know, like what do people dance to? Wow, that's fun. And if you ever get paid to play that, then then you win, right? <laughs> right. And as a bass player, man, I, I went to one of these bass camps in San Diego for Guitar Workshop Plus. Hey, Brian. And uh, one of my students was Sinbad, the comedian Sinbad. His wow. two beautiful daughters were there taking guitar courses. Uh -huh. And he walks in and he goes, Stu Hamp, teach me how to play bass. <laughs> I'm like, Sinbad, I loved you in Afros and Bell Bottoms on HBO, <laughs> man. That was the funniest thing ever, man. So I said, sure, man. I mean, the great thing about bass is you just – Take your hand and, and, and just put your hand here and play two notes. And again, everyone in the world can hear the whole song and know exactly what you're talking about. Right? You can hear, you know, where you're sitting, what bottle, body of water you're by, right? right? That, that, right. And that's the power, right? And again, it's establishing the tonality because if your guitar player or keyboard plays C, E, and G... And I play a C, it's a major chord, and everyone's happy. Yeah. Right? Now, if they play the same three notes, but I move my finger down three frets and play an A, it's a minor seven chord, and everyone's sad. So I have the power on that finger <laughs> to decide if a room full of people uh -huh. are happy or sad right. by moving my hand like an inch and a half. Uh -huh. That's pretty cool. That is very cool. I like that. So uh, the, the, ba the, the blues chord, the jazz chord starts real basic. And then it talks about just playing the root because, man, again, you, you can never go wrong playing simply as a bass player. With all these new techniques that I've come up with, man, when you're in a band situation or you're playing big band jazz as a bass player, you got to lay it down, brother. So we talk about then how to create uh, an interesting bass line, walking bass line, uh, from outlining chords and passing tones to chromatic tones. Uh, and then I sort of do a history of jazz of where it went sort of like big band swing into bebop, into rhythm changes, and then how Miles said, where can you go from the height of technical proficiency of like Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie playing Cherokee, mm -hmm. right? What do you do? Miles says, I know. Let's play D minor for half an hour. And you've mm -hmm. got modal jazz, right? Right. And then that goes into like Latin jazz, mm -hmm. right? So it uh, gives you an overview of different styles of jazz, uh, so you can sort of speak the language and learn some basic songs. So the first thing I do would be that modal jazz, which was where Miles, you know, kicked it back a notch, and and the songs like "So What" and um, um, the other tunes that are it's it's just kind of a play nice that modal jazz. I will. One. Let's do it. Let's play some modal jazz. What key? D minor.
talking, baby. So when you're playing, uh, you know, and you play in so many different types of ensembles and configurations, um, crazy. What what do you do uh, as the bass player when there is a rhythm guitar or keys playing chords, right? With you know supporting a soloist, soloist, and when there's not, is there a different approach? And what is it? Uh boy. I mean. Certainly, I, I play a lot of like instrumental rock, you know, and, and fusion kind of stuff. And certainly, if it's a trio, it does lend the bass player to be able to sort of add more chords. You know, when I play with like Greg Howe, mm -hmm. for instance, he loves it when I when I sort of double uh, the rhythm parts. You know, the problem is 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 trying to keep the low notes and the high notes going at the same time because what, once this goes away, mm -hmm. the party's over. Mm -hmm. You can't spend all your time going right because then it's not really playing bass. Right. The idea then is... To be able to find a, a way... To always keep the low note going on. Mm -hmm. You know, So every musical situation is different, and I'm so blessed, man, that that I get to play so many different kinds of music. I mean, this week alone, last week alone, check this out. So Monday, uh, I'm at Yoshi's in Oakland, and I'm playing in my trio with Joel Taylor, who's a great drummer, session player in LA, played with Alan Holdsworth, played with Yanni. There's the yin and yang of the musical world, but that's what we do. Mm -hmm. And Alex Skolnick on guitar, mm -hmm. Alex from Testament and Metal Allegiance, who also studied at the New School and has mm -hmm. a jazz trio himself mm -hmm. and has true fire courses. Mm -hmm. So that's Monday, we're in Oakland. Tuesday, we drive down to LA and we do two shows of The Big Potato, where we're joined by Tina Guo on cello, who you know from the um, Hans Zimmer tour and every major soundtrack mm -hmm. you've ever heard. Uh, she played acoustic cello on my version of Going to California mm -hmm. with a duet of the Prelude and C. And then she whipped out the electric and started dueling with Alex uh, on Radio Free Album Myth and playing solos. Mm -hmm. In the second set, the great young 20-year-old Indian bass player Mohini Day mm -hmm. came in and sat in with us. Mm. And then we move on to Wednesday where I'm down at the NAMM show giving a little demo for mm -hmm. the Zoom International Sales Meeting. Mm -hmm. And then by f Saturday night, I'm playing the Ultimate Jam Night <laughs> show at the California Ballroom um, at, uh, at the Hilton. Uh, the Ultimate Jam Night is a jam that's run every Tuesday at the Whiskey in L.A., run by Chuck Wright, who's a bass player for Quiet Wright, and Pauly mm -hmm. Z, who's a metal singer. And this is hair metal to the extreme. Mm -hmm. So that night, I got to play uh, Roadhouse Blues, yeah. The Doors, with uh, Vernon Reed from Living Color on oh, Guitar. Man. And I got to play uh, Tell Me What You Want <laughs> with Randy Jackson from the band Zebra, mm -hmm. which is like the ultimate hair band that I... I tried to burn them before, but I, I didn't really grow up listening to that. Uh -huh. But they, but then Paulie and those guys figured since I had long hair and played with Twitter Rock that I would know all those hair metal bands, and uh -huh. it was great. And then during the day, I'm doing my solo set and doing duets with Mohini at the Mark Bass booth. And then um, let me see, got home Sunday, Tuesday morning, six a.m. on a flight here to St. Petersburg to do a course on jazz and blues. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I get home Friday, and then Tuesday I fly to Greece to uh, play two shows with this great uh, Greek bass player named Yorgos Bacanas. That's one pronunciation uh -huh. name. Fark. <laughs> F-A-K-A-N-A-S. <laughs> yes. Bacanas. Yes. Okay, there we go. Okay. That works. Yeah. Use your imagination. And boy, that is some of the absolute most challenging material I've ever done. He did these great records with Anthony Jackson and a horn section. Now, Anthony Jackson nor the horn section are going to be there. So I'm I'm learning to just crazy hard. So you showed me um, the charts, I guess, <laughs> that you have to learn. So in yeah. between doing these sessions here, hanging out with us, you go back to the room, and I mean, there's a lot of black in between it, it, the it, bars, it, right? <laughs> it, it is, man. It's it, it's a real challenge, man. And uh, I actually asked him to send the redo the charts written down because I'm, uh, you know, and harmonically speaking, I'm pretty good at reading up to like the third ledger line yeah. up to a G. <laughs> but he's got stuff written up here, so he just ha I had him redo it down an octave and I do it. But you know, uh, it just takes like everything else, like what I preach: yeah. practice, mm -hmm. patience, 
and the passage of time. And there's a great app called you know, Transcribe, which what it does is it allows you to take like an eight bar phrase, loop it at like 50%, mm -hmm. right? So I can learn. And then you can slowly get it up. And right. So that's what I'm doing when I get home for like three days is just living with this. Which music. is, you know, that kind of like just blew me away because it's one thing to, you know, uh, get together with a bunch of players, play a gig, um, kind of be familiar enough with the music to pull it off. And another thing to have to learn charts so you're going to learn all these charts. Um, you, you left it at the hotel. I was hoping you'd have it so that you... But uh, fly to Greece, do the gig, and then come back, right? Yeah, I mean, it sounds great, people say. And, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so blessed. You know, uh, I, I just... I remember very, very early on in my career when I think I was, was in Boston, either going to Berkeley or just living in Boston... And we flew down to Miami to uh, fill in for six weeks for a, uh, a band on a cruise ship. And I realized that uh, I was being paid to fly someplace sh surely because of my musical talent. You know, they came from all the hard work and from me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nothing anyone gave me. Mm -hmm. It was stuff that I worked my butt off for. Mm -hmm. And people hired me for what I did. And I was flying someplace new. And, I, man, I've been everywhere in the world pretty much. Mm -hmm. You, know? you have. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, just cra it's, crazy. Crazy it, luck. It uh, we talk about this too about how you know it appears to be very glamorous, you know, <laughs> but, but maybe but the, not so all the well, time. I know, right? but the, the reality is, I mean, it's 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 a challenge to, to learn the music, which is great. Yeah. I love a challenge, but the reality is, is that when I leave uh, the uh, fifth and fly, you know, first of all, I got to get to LAX from Tahunga. There's I don't even want to talk about that, <laughs> you know. Right. I think it's a pretty nice flight. It's like five in the afternoon, so I can leave early and beat traffic. Uh -huh. It's not too bad. Uh, and fly to Istanbul and change planes and fly to Greece, and then get there late the sixth, rehearse the seventh, play the eighth and the ninth, and then have like a seven a.m. flight home the next day, and mm. we'll probably land in L.A. just in time for rush hour traffic, which mm. will take me three hours to get home. Mm -hmm. That's that's the reality. So there's no, I won't be like hanging out, you know, on the yeah. islands of Lesbos no, with no. a drink in my hand. Tell the myself. Argentina story. Well, cause you never know what's going to happen. That's the the crazy thing about the, about this business is, I've got a bunch of friends in Argentina, Marcelo, Ciao, Bello, <laughs> Hola, um, and uh, years ago, um, you know, I played there with Joe, and I've done a bunch of clinics there, and I know my again my friend Marcelo who writes for a magazine. So I did a clinic at um, a club called Patecos, and I met the uh, owner of it, and they had a really cool T-shirt. It was a black T-shirt with the silver stuff on it. So I, I, I said, man, send me one of those shirts, and I wore it in a Satriani video. Mm -hmm. So we kind of kept in touch over the years. And then he called me up and he said, Estu, I'm coming to L.A. I manage a new band. We want you to uh, you know, play a song on the record. And you know, I, I should have just Googled the band before I did. He goes, how much you want? And I named a, a pretty nice figure, and he said, okay. And I was like, damn it. I should have asked for more. <laughs> because it turns out this band is the most popular pop band in Argentina. Uh -huh. So then there's a guy I met at this club doing a clinic for, it was a good clinic, a couple hundred people, local, great local musicians from Argentina. Uh, so they flew me down to be a guest star for uh, La Barisa when they played River Plate Stadium. River Plate, as you know, is one of the two great soccer teams from, from Buenos Aires, along mm -hmm. with Boca Juniors. Yeah. Of course, I'm a River Plate fan. <laughs> uh, so we played River Plate Stadium in front of like 70,000 people. <laughs> and I just got out there and played three songs, and it was so much fun, and, and uh, they treated me well, and you just never know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And again, the songs were just... <laughs> but I played it great. <laughs> and I, I played it authentically, and I kicked it in the ass. It was great. It was so much fun. So sometimes everything works well, yeah, and sometimes not so well, right? Well, are... man, I mean, yeah, I mean, we can't get around the fact that uh, the whole music industry has changed, you know, with the internet, with streaming and stuff. And not to take a cynical view, and again, I'm 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 blessed by what I do. I love what I do. I've just been given so many uh, opportunities to meet people and. I'd go anywhere in the world. Every, everywhere I've been, people are wonderful. You know, every, everywhere I've been. I'd go to Beirut or Iran or the Middle East or 
anywhere in a heartbeat because mm -hmm. you know, people love music and right. like you just went to Cuba man I'd love yeah. to go there and just yeah. meet the people people are people man um, uh, uh, but you know I mean the way that, that before the internet and before streaming services you know people used to have to hire a bass player right you know now they have machines that can do that and again just just you know uh, you know I've got a, like I said you know a, a daughter and uh, who's of that age who grew up with streaming and you know, I, I came from where I make money off people buying records. Mm -hmm. And now that the second that I put out a new CD and someone puts it on YouTube, unless I've got a team of lawyers, mm -hmm. people can get it for free. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a big dip in my income, you know, mm -hmm. and certainly a lot of uh, secondary way to supplement just making a living as a musician is working with companies. You know, I've been with GHS Strings forever which is great. I, you know, I love my GHS boomers and I've actually been with the company longer than the current president, Russ. Hi, Russ. Hi, Connie. Mm -hmm. Hi, Lila. Mm -hmm. And they give me free strings. That makes me so happy. And but, well, you but now they're also terrific people. Oh, I mean, God. and one of the things that you have always, you have never worked with a company that I know of that a, you haven't really believed in their products and they haven't been good people i mean you, you, you it's like a, a good business you know yeah you have to but it's, it's at the end of the day it is people too you know yeah you know you don't want to get a you know and unless the money was stupid i mean if you want to pay me a lot of money yeah millions of dollars maybe i'll there's a number maybe, right well, I, don't, I don't know what the number <laughs> no, is of course there's always the number but uh but it's great man like like right now you know i've got a great thing going on with mark base you know yeah. which is their rise is incredible you know marco uh, Dividualis uh, is the guy that created Parsec that then became Mark Bass. And, you know, he literally started out building amps in his parents' basement. And they're and very passionate. Well, they, they, you very you passionate. remember, they went from, you know, the basement of the NAMM show That's to right. like in 60, a little tiny booth. and To, to like 60% of the but, basement. But, you know, right they've always been uh, super passionate. Um, you know, they love the artists, and they put everything into their product. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. you know, you love people like that. Right? They, they do it in their Italian, so when I go over there, I we, know, we eat pretty exactly. well. Yeah, I'm we sure have a good time, do. Marco yeah. and Ricardo and Cicino. And who else are you working with? Well, I also want to talk for a minute about what the, the thing with Mark Bass is. They are sort of known as... I love the Italians, but they, more than anyone, are just still stuck in Jocko world, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. there's this whole generation of bass players that sort of still, you know, and, and I'm not in any way bad mouthing, but, you know, like guys yeah. like Jeff Berlin, Hadrian Ferro, yeah. still sort of had that trebly sound and play this, you know, mm -hmm. quarter 16th note bebop phrasing thing. That's mm -hmm. great, man. That's great. Uh, and, and, and Mark Bass has sort of been known for the, that style of bass players. Mm -hmm. You know, from from all those guys, from again, from Hadrian to Jeff Berlin was the first guy to really, you know, I guess most people know Mark Bass from from Jeff Berlin in the player sure. school, um, and all the Itali great Italian bass players are sort of post jockle players. So the idea when I talked with Marco and Cicino, the engineer, was you know the other thing I want to do is I want to do something different. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't just want to take something that's out there and slap my name on it. Yeah. You know, so uh, we said, well, hey, you know, what what can we do to sort of increase Mark Bass's visibility into the rock world because mm -hmm. they're sort of known for that, you know, bridge pickup, jackal sort of sound. Yeah. And I said, well, okay, number one, let's look at the cabinet. You know, uh, four by ten cabinets are cool, but you can't go to a rock show with a four by ten cabinet, and we're all too old to take Ampeg eight by tens to the mm -hmm. gig anymore, right? So we came up with this great cabinet. It's about this high. I'm sure Tommy is. Flying pictures of it across the screen now as we speak. <laughs> uh, so it's it's like mid size. It's big enough to look cool. Yeah. It's got two 15s and a horn, so it's got incredible clarity and uh, it, you know real depth in the low end. And the head, it's the same thing. No real rocker. I'm sorry. You, part of the part of it is looking cool. Let's be serious about it, <laughs> right, right? right? And jazz cool is a little different than rock cool. Right. So you can't go on stage and rock it with some little teeny little. Walter Wood's head, right? right? So we made the amp bigger with big knobs and bright yeah. lights, yeah. and it's got a solid state side. It's got a tube preamp if you want to play real yeah. heavy rock. I work with Cecenia, who's the electrician. Mm -hmm. You know, each sounds great. You can blend the two of them together. Yeah. Uh, it's just brandly new, uh, and then that last month or so in the guitar centers near you, and they just really versatile. Sounds great. Check it out. It's wonderful. So talk about the shirt. I love that shirt. I hope I hope you leave it behind. Well, I got I got a bunch of them. Thank you, Carrie. Well, you know that uh, Carrie Lathan uh, runs a company called Lathan Basewear. I'm sure it's LathanBasewear.com or go to Facebook, or whatever. And they have been rocking, you know, cool ass bass gear forever. You know, Victor wears their stuff. Gerald Veasley, real big in the African American bass community. 
people like me. And uh, but they're they're great. I mean, Carrie's a good friend of mine, and it's just really cool, man. I love this shirt. This is the hockey jersey, but they do T-shirts and baseball jerseys and hats and caps. Of course, I don't wear a hat, you know, with all the money I spent on this wig that I'm wearing now. You know, why would I ruin it with a hat? <laughs> but uh, my look over the years has sort of evolved into this this uh, hockey jersey look, and uh-huh. it's made me a couple custom ones. But again, go to their website. They got really cool hats and shirts, and it's just it's just a way of saying, you know, get with the program. We're bass players. We yeah. love it. We're we're proud to be bassists, and uh, thank you, Carrie. I love you, man. God bless you. God bless you. Let's uh, let's play some music. All I, right. I, as you know, have always been a big fan of you know the solo stuff. All that right. You do. Pick uh, pick any one of your tunes and play it. Well, this is um, on the my last release was called the Diary of Patrick Xavier, complete solo bass piece. Uh, on the album before that. Of the Book of Lies, I wrote a six-piece suite for solo electric bass because, like it or not, uh, you know when I grow up, when I grew up again, bass played like this, right? That was bass playing, and then on November eighth, nineteen seventy-eight, at uh, the Beacon Theater in Boston, I saw Weather Report with Jaco Pastorius, mm. and apparently no one had told Jaco that bass shouldn't be played as a solo instrument. <laughs> so that changed everyone's life. Uh, and, and so now, like it or not, there exists a form of music called solo bass playing. You know, I may be partially responsible for the popularization of it. It was co- coming of age as that style of bass music layer came, came of age. In fact, I was in Korea, and I went to a high school where they had a course on solo bass playing. But there's not a lot of pedagogy for it, not a lot of music written for it. So I wrote a six-piece suite for solo electric bass. And every piece, again, subliminally, is also a teaching tool. They're meant to be played. You can learn these like four-minute pieces to play as a concert piece. And I've got a great, I got a video of a guy in Iran, you know, some high school kid playing one of my pieces for his recital. It just it's, makes me so happy, man. Such a blessing. Um, but every piece is different. You know, one piece uh, is all chordal. One piece is all tapping, one's slapping, one's harmonics, to sort of show you how you can make a solo bass piece interesting, right, by telling a story. Because if it's just fast slapping and E, that's not really the story you're trying to tell is look at me, look at me, look at me, mm-hmm. look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And, and that story gets boring quick, mm-hmm. right? But to make it interesting, you have all these tools of harmonics, chords and stuff like that, different ways. So every piece uses a different technique to show you a strategy for creating a piece that will be interesting for you, the player, and for the audience. So here's the first piece called uh, Etude Number 1, and it sort of combines a couple different techniques and shows you how you can hopefully make a solo bass piece interesting. And it goes like this.
would you do a little bit of going to California? That's one of my Yeah, favorites. absolutely. Uh, do you still do uh, the, uh, you know, uh, you, you do a solo concert, you tell some stories, you play some, do you still do those? I do. In fact, the, the last record, The Diary of Patrick Xavier, which I did a great Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign for. In fact, there's still perks available. You can still go on Indiegogo and buy CDs, sign CDs, have me play on your record, take Skype lessons. Uh, and that was a really personal record where, uh, you know, every song that I write is about something. But no, no one ever asked me why I wrote the song. They say, how do you play that riff in E? Right. They never asked me why, yeah. what going to California is about. And I'll tell you. So I, I thought I'd put the cart before the horse in this record. And for every song, there is a photograph and a little short story where I talk about, you know, why I wrote the song and what it's about and how I recorded it. And this version of Going to California is about my favorite place on planet Earth. And I've been to a lot of places, but there's this little place called Muir Beach Overlook, Brad, that's about halfway between Stinson Beach and Muir Beach in California. And uh, man, it's just, uh, it's my happy place. So that's what I think about when I play Going to California. in Western Marin. Man, I, I, I love that tune. I really well, that do. was one of the great nights at the old uh, All-Star Guitar Night. Yeah. It's when I got to play that with Alan Pasqua mm -hmm. and um, Peter Erskine. I remember that. I mean, Man. talk about, I mean, that just brought everyone out of their seats. It was I incredible. Well, that's what I love about music, man. I, I, where I'm at now is I, I try to create music that are templates. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to break people's preconceptions. You send them a tape, they think that's the way you want them to play it. And yeah. I'm like, man, every time I play this, I want it to be different. Yeah. And I want you to bring whatever you have to the song. So yeah. I can, I'm blessed that I keep hearing new ways. Like when we play The Big Potato, there's video of it with Tino Guo playing cello on it. It's just <laughs> beautiful, man. I was, I, I was so happy, man. You know, be uh, be interesting to have all of those recorded on one album, all the different iterations and variations. You, I know. Know? you know, I was thinking about that. I, I in, in one in one song, um, uh, it was on, on the record called "Just Outside of Normal," yeah. and uh, I, I wrote this song, and I was this close to having um, what's his name from Queen play on it, uh, the guitar player. Come uh, on, Brian. Uh, Brian. Yeah. God. Who? 
Brian May, of yeah. course, my good friend Brian May. Yeah. We'd met at, at a Satriani show at Shepherd Butcher Empire, yeah. and uh, his wife was a fan of the Moonlight Sonata version of mine. So he was going to play on it, and then I yeah. realized it would, you know, Brian's royalty. So it wasn't like, I'll send you the tape and you record <laughs> right. your own studio. It was <laughs> right. going to be exactly. like, it would have cost a little to fly over and rent out RCA yeah. Studios. So anyway, so uh, I sent it. I asked um, another guitar player uh, to see if he could recommend someone, and he said, I'll play on it. And man, he definitely heard something different than I did on it. Mm -hmm. And ended up, it was a mellow song, and he just like played this rainstorm of notes. So I, th I thought about recording one song yeah. and just having like 10 guitar players play it yeah. and how different it would be. Well, you'll you know? probably do that one day. Yeah, I'm, you know? I'm sure I will. Um, more shout outs for you from Missouri, Sweden, Halifax, yeah. Toronto, Bangladesh. Halifax, love Halifax. Uh, Puerto Rico, Argentina. My friend John Mater's in Puerto Rico playing uh, Hamilton with Lynn Manuel. I'll Miranda. tell you, you've got friends all over the world. You are one traveling bass player. Uh, man. You're all over. You're like Where's Waldo kind of a thing. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, 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 we have a, you know, obviously a lot of artists coming through, but. I don't think anybody does what you do, you know. Well, plenty of people do, but man, I mean, some no, of the crazy not stories. to the degree. I mean, you play with so many different in so <laughs> many different styles. You do awesome clinics and and workshops. I mean, you really you're very uh, resourceful. You know, like you have adapted to the new landscape of. But there is no the, plan B, you know, Brad. You know right. That. There's no plan. B. I mean, it's it's really amazing what you do. Uh, I want to talk a minute. We've had a lot of questions about, um, you know, guitar players that want to learn to play bass or where should they dig in. You know, when you look at your library here at True Fire, remember we started with Bass Basics, right. Fretboard Fitness, Tap Bass, and Slap Bass was kind of the first series, right? Right. Um, then you did uh, Solo Bass, uh, which was you know it, it, really incredible um for those bass players that wanted to learn the art of playing solo bass right um uh everybody loves 50 pro bass grooves you must boy know. that's a great one what a great rhythm section that's oh one with carl God. verheyen and yeah. um um yeah bernie dressel yeah Ooh. incredible the rock bass grooves funk bass grooves great 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 um then you did funk bass for beginners and then those first steps next steps for beginners right yeah yeah so, the essentials yeah um where where would you have you know a guitar player that's been playing intermediate to late intermediate even advanced where would should a guitar player start at the very beginning, e even though a lot of it would be very rudimentary? I, I would say that, like, you know, bass basics is really like, you know, here's how to plug your chord in. Right. You know, this is an E string. Right. So, assumingly that if a guitar player has some general musical knowledge, so yeah. they've been playing guitar, yeah. I would say the 50 grooves. Yeah. Because it's not just um, theoretical knowledge, it's practical right. knowledge. Right. It's what I do is, again, I had Carl Verheyen, who's one of the greatest session players, in LA, played in every TV movie you can ever think of, played with Super Tramp, and Bernie Dressel, who again is one yeah. of the top, you know, I think played with the Brian Setzer big band, and yeah. every, you know, cheers, and just uh, resume, pages, pages long. So we recorded 50 different grooves, right? And it's it, right away, you're playing along. It's like I said, we can have one rhythm track, like say a, a regular blues, and I'll show you like three different bass lines to play. So I can show you a simple bass line. And we alter the grooves. And so I show you, you know, how to play a bass line that fits in it. And then you can loop the tracks playing with Carl and Bernie and make up your own bass lines. Mm -hmm. So um, you're immediately playing. And it goes from really simple songs to really complicated stuff. In seven, and you cover and metal a whole bunch of different grooves, styles. It's sort Latin of like. Latin and jazz. And you know, you, you, you get a grip on those 50 grooves and you can probably, you know make it happen for yourself in pretty much any gig, right? I think so. That was it, the whole intent of that course, right? Yeah, and, and again, it's you're, you're immediately playing bass, and if you're playing with those guys and you're playing like guitar riffs on the bass, you're going to hear that, hey, that doesn't work. Yeah. Right? It's going to show you. Yeah. You know, bass basics is great for, for kids or someone that's an absolute beginner. Yeah. Um, the real one that I love that I'm really, I mean, I'm proud of them all, but fretboard fitness is real, yeah. real near and dear to my heart. It's a workout. Yeah. Right, but it is really man. The, you know what I teach about theory and understanding. Because yeah. when I look at the neck, man, I I I'm I'm just seeing shapes and I know every note, 
And this just takes you through the scales and the modes and chords. And yeah, that, that's good. There were a lot of questions about what's good workouts, what are good exercises. That one has it. That's right? got it all. That's fret got my board, whole warm-up routine fitness. that I do every day. You know, if, you, if you're a bass player that's, that, you know, is beyond, you know, this is an A string and this is a whole note. Right. If, if you can get fretboard fitness and work it from the beginning to the end, then, dude, let's talk. Right. That call was, me up and we'll do Skype lessons. Yeah, that was very <laughs> cool. Um, quickly, what was the website where the hats and the shirts are? Uh, so Lathon, L-A-T-H-A-O-N, Lathon Basswear. Beautiful. Uh, that, you go, go to their um, uh, Facebook page, and I'm sure they'll take you right to their link of their store. It's great stuff. Cool. One other of your True Fire projects I wanted to mention was In the Jam, because you came in with Carl Verheyen then, right? And who was and our Jonathan drummer? Mover, and Jonathan my, my Mover, my rhythm section buddy from the. Uh, and you also did a whole variety of styles: some yeah. funk stuff, some country stuff, some jazz stuff. And if they wanted to, they could mute you and yeah. play your parts. Right? Yeah, yeah. For for and it's like a we talk about it's the same song, and you can hear. Uh, Carl and Jonathan and I talk about what we're thinking about yeah. when we're playing it. So you yeah, get a, that the was drummer's a great perspective. Project. That was great. Well, you know, you keep coming up with new uh, new formats, man. <laughs> yeah, You're the brains of the operation. New stuff coming I'm down just the bike, too. Um, uh, uh, obviously, um, a lot of people are asking about, you know, slap and tap. Could, right. could you do a little bit on, on that? Maybe play a little bit. And just a quick rundown on how you approach it. You yeah. you were the first bass player I heard do that. I mean, clearly at the forefront of that whole thing, right? Well, I, let's let's look back at the. I mean, obviously Stanley Jordan. Yeah. Right. And uh, obviously Billy Sheehan yep. did a sort of different way. But right. the, the the way that I approached the tapping again was after I saw. Jocko, mm -hmm. right? It's like wow. Okay, maybe bass could be a solo instrument. Mm -hmm. And coming from a classical. You know, background. I mean, my my favorite musician and, and one of my closest friends, even though he's been dead for 40, 50 years, is, is the Canadian pianist Glenn Gould. Mm. And I say my closest friend because I have almost daily contact with mm. him. I, I listen to Glenn Gould sometime during the day, mm. right? And I love that this the incredible within boundaries. That's where the what's where real artistry artistry comes from. You know, the piano. It's just one guy at a piano. He just doesn't have pedal boards or loopers. That's just him. Right. Yep. And 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 playing these notes, he's got to play those exact notes that Bach wrote 250 years ago. Mm -hmm. So how's he going to make it sound different than the thousands of other people that have played it? Right. Well, when he plays it, you mainly go, "That's Glenn Gould." Uh -huh. Right. That that fascinates me. That uh -huh. interests me. Yeah. And gets my full attention. Yeah. So uh, I played piano for years and years, which certainly helped with the independence. But so after I I, I heard Jacko play solo, I, I I tried to work on. I had some pieces that I played. One of them was a Gershwin prelude number two. And I said, well, let me try to work on some of my piano pieces on the bass. So here's the main riff. I can play that. But the second part's in C sharp, and it has a sound that goes. I'm going. <laughs> right. right. I couldn't figure out to play it. Yeah. So at the time, uh, I was at Berklee College of Music in Boston, and I was playing with Steve Vai, and that's when Eddie Van Halen first came out with uh, Eruption, you know. <laughs> right? But, yeah. but slow that down. Wait a minute. So if I wanted to play that G, usually it would take two hands, one to fret the note and one to pluck it to get the sound. But look at that. Okay, so one hand can do one thing, and that leaves the figure. So then I could play. And then I started working on, you know, Bach pieces. The great thing about, for me, is my, I didn't learn to tap so I could get into a shooting war with Billy Sheehan or anything, right? It was to play music. And when you play piano, harmony is so easy to see laid out, you know, like a major chord is whole step, whole step, half step, and a bass tuned in fourths. It's sort of hard to, to visualize or see it. But then, so I'm learning this, and look at it, okay, that's, that's just a C triad. My hand knows that shape. 
the second chord. Look, that's a D minor with the C or seventh in the bass. And the next chord. Well, look, that's just a G7 with a third in the bass. Back to a C triad. Bing! Light bulb, right? Uh -huh. So it, it really allowed me to see harmony in a different way on the bass. Uh, and from there, of course, it ended up with all that stuff. So uh, I didn't invent tapping. I was there when it was born. I certainly got a lot of the two-part... <laughs> maybe before people got to it, but my own unique way of doing it. Uh, and that evolved into just a lot of ways, again, to make playing a solo bass piece interesting. Slap. Uh, slap, yes, sir. <laughs> well, so, gosh, where did, you know, uh, when I was, uh, 1979, I left Berklee College of Music and played uh, for about a year with an Elvis Presley impersonator in Holiday Inns all over West Virginia and, and the South. And disco wasn't too bad for a bass player, you know? And... <laughs> You know, boogie, oogie, oogie was the first time I heard anything approaching slap bass. Get down, boogie, oogie, oogie, get down. Right? So, and then, of course, Larry Graham, and then here comes. Stanley Clark. Hi, Stanley. Um, so, man, everyone has a different way of, of slapping the bass. You know, when I see people, I, have, I can only teach the way that I do it. And like anything else you learn, you take little bits and pieces uh, that's come before you and put it together and, and make your own, uh, you know, your own version of it. I learned by listening to Paul McCartney and John Entwistle and Chris Squire and then Jocko and Jeff Berlin and, and all the great players, Stanley Clark, that came before me. And I just took that and, and moved on with it. So, um, so when I see people like Flea and, and Robert Trujillo that hold their bases down low, I have no idea how they can slap but they do and it sounds great so the moral of the story is that you know whatever works for you is the right answer but i teach a real uh economical way of slapping where my arm is is parallel to it but the most important thing is to get a good sound because you know man we're playing music and it's supposed to sound good so you don't have to hit it too hard i mean that's you'll know you're doing it right when it sounds good if you're going and hitting down if you're hitting down on the string and the sound man hears that sound of your string hitting the pickup, you'll never be in the PA, right? <laughs> so the idea is to hit the string and get out of the way of it so it can ring. So for me, I'm going, what's my catchphrase? Uh, from the nipple to the navel, right? I'm hitting the top of the string with the side of my thumb and getting out of the way so the string can ring. Right, and then one of the ways that I've designed my signature basses, my signature Warwick basses, designed by Marcus Spangler, Dunka, Vielen Dank, Marcus, um, is to have the right amount of length so I can rest my fingers on the body and just have the tip of them underneath it. So when I'm popping the string, I'm not actually popping the joints to get the string to sound. That would be too hard. You can never do it fast enough. But if my strings, my fingers are underneath the string, and I just open up my hand like I'm doing the Queen Elizabeth wave, hello. So glad that you could join us, hello. So if, my, if I just open up my hand and again take my thumb and open my wrist from the nipple to the navel, then my finger moves and the string's in the way, so it has to pop. That, that's pretty economical movement there, right? And then it leads to a series of triplets like uh,
Okay. Um, more shout outs. Uh, Kenya, Geneva are shouting out, and the real Alex Skolnick. The real Alex Skolnick. Is What's shouting up, out, Stu. What up, brother? <laughs> man, we had such a great time, man. I, I love Alex, man. He was. He's a phenomenal the, uh, player. Back in the yeah. day, back in 90, 91, when uh, I was sort of king of the bass world, and I had a sort of a hit with the song Lone Star that yeah. Eric Johnson was on. Yeah. I was looking for guitar players yeah. to do, and I, I had every hair guitar player. I had Guy Man Dude. Yeah. Chris and Politeri, yeah. uh, go down the list of hair guitar players you can think oh, of. Oh, God. Joey yeah. Tafoya, yeah. <laughs> right? All these guys uh, auditioned, and they all came in, and they all played Eric Johnson's solo note for note. Uh -huh. And then Alex came in and played his own solo, and I said, you're hired. <laughs> and um, then he, he was just recently, at that time, he was in Testament, and then he moved back to New York and went to the new school and started his it's exploration of jazz. And then about five years ago, I decided I hadn't toured the Stu Ham Band for a long time. And mm -hmm. I, I, I got it back together and I called Alex to play. And man, just after 20 years, turns out we'd both evolved as people, as yeah. musicians, we're better friends. I, I mean, he's just a guy that's so uh, open and wants to learn. Yeah, and, he's and incredible. Just a great player, man. And he can, you know, we play this instrumental jazz rock music and but when when we want to go rock, he's got that thing, that testament thing. I mean, he can really go there. He, Brilliant, he definitely, dear, dear, and dear he's friend. a great educator as well. We did, Absolutely. you know, like you mentioned, um, you know, took many years for the schedules to mesh up. But he was in here just recently, did his first project, and also very passionate about the instrument and education. One of my one of my one of my dearest friends. Yeah, I've slept very cool at his house, and he slept at my house. Yeah, nice. Well, there you go. Hi, um, do you snore? Oh, by the way, it checks in the mail for the uh, Yoshi's gig. You should <laughs> yeah. get it any minute. Literally. Um, we've heard is. that before. No. Um, all right. So, listen, we, we're running a little over. Um, pick any solo tune. We, we were going to play a track and play. What do you want to play us out with? Pick another solo tune. Oh, what do I want to play us out with? I will play. Oh, let's, let's play the hit, shall we? Let's do it. All right. Here we go. so much Thanks, for Brad. carving out this time to uh you know i know we got to finish up your projects a little bit then we've got, we got dinner to tonight do. we got a little bit of work to do and uh thanks to everybody out there for tuning in today and every day and supporting the cause here at true fire we really really appreciate you um and we look forward to uh seeing and hearing from you soon that's it stewham.com and again go to indiegogo 
and you can still order those cops signed copies of the Diary of Patrick Xavier. Hire me to play on your demos and get Skype lessons and all that good stuff. So check it out, man. There you thank go. you, Brad. Thank Later. you, Tommy. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Allie. <laughs> thank you, Ren. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>